Good morning. Well, why did it get quiet all of a sudden like that? That was kind of weird. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here. I'm glad to, uh, for the people watching on the live stream that you're with us as well. Uh, a couple quick announcements, mainly just about the schedule today and this week. Uh, take the guest books, if you would, and fill those out and pass those down so the people uh, next to you can uh, sign uh, their names there as well. Um, no Bible study after worship service this morning. We'll be back here tonight at 11.30, though, uh, for the uh, midnight um, candlelight service, Christmas Eve service. And then tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for the Christmas morning uh, worship service. That'll be a communion service tomorrow morning as well. Uh, there's no men's Bible study this week. Um, although, uh, if you're in the men's Bible study, I have the... the uh, the study guides up here. So grab one before you go. We'll meet two weeks from now and we'll jump into the first uh, chapter of the book up here. So uh, grab that before you go. Uh, if you don't get it today, uh, you can pick it up next Sunday as well. Uh, no youth group this Wednesday night and no ladies Bible study this Saturday morning. So I think that's all I have about announcements. Let's go ahead and stand and sing the opening hymn.
continue in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. confess our sin to God. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, be the God of your people today. We confess that we have worshipped too many other gods. We have devoted ourselves to all too many different values. Turn our hearts to you again. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, be the God of your people today. We confess that we have visited all too many sanctuaries We have tried to find the sources of life in all too many other places. Turn our hearts to you again. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, be the God of your people today. We turn to you and to you alone to be our God, our only God. Forgive our sins. Give us spiritual integrity. Give us wholeness and holiness. Answer us in the name of Christ. For he has promised to intercede for us. It is in him that we pray, in the fellowship of his body. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Psalm 89, first five verses. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Old Testament reading for uh, fourth Sunday in Advent is 2 Samuel 7, which is the covenant that God made with David. It's the text that, I, that, that Psalm 89 that we just read a second ago is uh, quoting. Now when the king, this is David, now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that's in your heart for the Lord is with you. David wants to build a, a, a brick and mortar house for the uh, ark of the covenant, a temple. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I've moved with all the people of Israel, did I, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus shall you say to, to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure be forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistle reading is from Romans 16. Paul says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 1. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. So um, this is, I, I, th- I think that this is the main uh, Christmas service that people are going to come to. Uh, Christmas morning is usually pretty lightly attended, unless it's on Sunday like it was last year. Christmas Eve, very late for uh, some of you, and so I know that not a lot of people will be here tonight. A lot, some of you will be, but not a lot of you. So on a, on a, I try to pick out the service around Christmas where the most people will be there who don't come to church frequently. Because this is, you know, this is their, uh, you know, they come on Christmas and Easter and stuff like that. And I, I, for those of you who are here all the time, you have to hear this uh, spiel. But I'm going to give it again now because I think it's important. T- today what we're going to think about is uh, the virgin birth of Jesus and what that means for us. And so I want to start off before I actually get into the sermon proper and say a few words about um, the virgin birth and the possibility of the virgin birth. Of course, it's ridiculous to believe that virgins can have babies. And there are a lot of people who would say this is superstitious for me to get up here and say that there was a virgin who had a baby. And um, let me just talk about that for just a few minutes. And let me emphasize that it's not a question of smart or dumb, or rational versus superstitious, or reasonable versus opinionated and faith-based that it comes down to like one of two separate worldviews that you can have that underline what you think about things like the virgin birth. And one of those worldviews is called philosophical materialism. And what it means is, what philosophical materialism is, is this. It's the belief that only the physical exists, that only what you can experience with your senses or with an instrument that's designed to heighten your senses, like a telescope or a microscope, only what you can experience, that's the only thing that's real. Everything else is made up. 
The other worldview would be that there's more to what you can see and feel and experience that exists in the world. There's more out there. The, 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 there's, there's stuff that's there that's not available to human senses and human experience. And that's basically, the two, this is the two choices. And what you think about that's going to come down to that. Let me emphasize that the second view, the view that there is a spiritual world there, that there's more than what our, than, than what our senses can experience, is by far the majority view. Almost everybody throughout human history and almost everybody on the earth today believes that that's the case. The amount of people who believe that this is superstition, we know that this, is, this doesn't happen, only what you can rationally prove, that's the only thing that can happen. That's a small minority of people in human history. It's basically white people for the past 300 years. Everybody else in the history of the world and everybody else on the earth today disagrees with this. So it's not a question of smart or dumb. It's a question of philosophical presuppositions. If you don't think that God exists, or if he does exist, that he would never have anything to do with this world, then of course the virgin birth is stupid. But if God does exist, and by the way, you can't prove either one of those, right? I can't prove to you that God does exist. If you're an agnostic or an atheist, you can't prove to me that God doesn't exist, which means that both of us are having a conversation about something we believe by faith. It's a religious conversation. You don't, don't, don't imagine that you're rational just because you say, I believe God doesn't exist. It's not rational. It's a faith position, just like my position is a faith position. We both bring our faith positions to the table. And if you think that God doesn't exist, then of course, virgins can't have babies. If I think that God does exist, and he does act in the world, and specifically in the story of the Bible, that he's decided to write himself into the story, a virgin birth is the kind of thing you would expect to happen. It doesn't, I'm not, it doesn't prove it, but it's the kind of thing that you would expect to happen. Okay, it's, it, somebody will say, well, okay, well, yeah, still, we know it's not biologically possible, so it's still, still superstitious. It's not superstitious. It's not that the people of that period, any more than you guys, think that virgins just walk around and get pregnant every, you know, every once in a while. Everybody knows. You know. I know. Atheists know. Mary knew. Virgins don't get pregnant. That's the whole point. The whole point is that it's a one-off event. The whole th the thing about it is that if that God's going to become a human being, it's going to take something like a miraculous impossibility for it to happen. So I, I know I didn't prove it to everybody here, and um, not all of you needed that conversation. I tried to do that, and, and I'll do something similar Easter Sunday, of course, too, when we talk about the resurrection. But for those of you who have questions about that, or for those of you who are tempted to think, well, there's ration, and then there's my Christianity, which is just kind of a faith shot in the dark. No, that's not the case. You don't need to be worried about that. Everybody's working on a basis of faith, no matter what their worldview. It's just a question of what's your presupposition? What's your faith presupposition? In this case, uh, I'll be talking for the next 20 minutes. And so my faith presupposition is that there's a God who exists, who's written himself into human history. And so that's just the assumption that I'm going to use. And it's not my assumption. I'm actually just pulling it straight from the story of Scripture. So let's get into it now. And I don't want to read, the, I don't want to look at this whole text. I'm going to focus mainly on verses 31 and 32. But I want to think about Jesus' birth and what does it mean for us. And of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg like any sermon about Jesus is. And I want to point out just two things, two things that the virgin birth, two things that the incarnation of, of God means for us as humans. And one is, is that there's a godness to humanity. There's a godness. There's something godlike about human beings. And the second thing is, is that there's a humanity to God. And these two things go together. And, and you can't have one without the other, especially the second one. The first one only makes sense if the second one is true. But first of all, the first one, the godness of humanity. The godness of humanity. So verse 31 Gabriel's talking to Mary and says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Mary, it's going to be your womb, your baby. It's going to be a son that you have. Mary, this is going to be your son. This is going to be a human being. This is the thing that makes Christianity different than every other worldview. One of a couple of things that makes Christianity different than every other worldview, every, every religion in the entire universe, and that is, is that the God that you if you're a Christian, worship and the I worship is a human being. We don't worship some sort of 
space ghost. We don't worship some sort of force that permeates everything. We don't worship the man upstairs. We worship a Jewish construction worker. God became a human being. In everything that you know about God, you and I can only know about God by knowing Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, Paul insists that Jesus, he didn't say the Father, he didn't say the Spirit. Other places in Scripture talk about the Father and the Spirit being involved in this. Colossians 1, though, specifically says that Jesus is the creator of everything, and by him, by, by him all things were created, and through him all things consist. In other words, everything that's created is created by an act of this Jewish construction worker who lived 2,000 years ago. So you drive down the street, you drive into the parking lot, and it's a different time of year. Those, those are the five trees there off to the side as you pull in. Every single leaf that will grow on those trees has been created individually by this Jewish construction worker. Now somebody might say, well, that's good. It's, it's very micromanaging of him. Well, that's, he's God. Yes, he's a, he's a human being, but he's also God. The fact that your heart is beating right now and that you're breathing right now without willing it to happen is, Colossians 1.17 insists, an act of Jesus himself. He is willing every single person's heart to keep beating. He's willing the atoms of the entire universe to hold together. Through him, all things consist. And because Jesus, the eternal God, has become a man, it validates something different about humans in every other part of existence. Think of it this way. Ask yourself the question. Why did God choose to become a human being? If God was going to write him into the story, himself into the story, couldn't he have made himself some sort of like powerful avatar? Like what if he, what if he came down like 20 feet tall and like glowing light? He totally could have done that, right? He, he, he could have been like, like Vishnu where he puts on some sort of like a human, he's not really a human, but it's a kind of a human disguise and comes down as like this mighty warrior or this cosmic guru. I guess he could have come as anything, right? He could have come as a dolphin if he had wanted to, I guess. That'd be kind of weird, but why a human being? Why would he come down here and look like just a normal person? Like, it's, when, when pe the people who knew Jesus struggled to think of him as God. It's not until after his re resurrection that even his closest friends were like, oh, holy cow, what just happened there? That, we should worship that guy. Not, not just he's powerful and not just that he's wise, not just that he's good, but he's worthy of worship. He is the creator God. Why did he do that? Well, it's a part of the whole story of the Bible, right? From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, I'll talk more about Genesis 1 in the sermon tomorrow, from the very beginning, God has decided that humans are going to be the special vehicle that he uses to connect with his universe. Humans above all other creatures. Humans are unique. Humans are different than any other thing that God has created. Humans are made in his image. We are made to look like him. And when he becomes a human being at the incarnation, he, he validates that. He puts his stamp on humanity. There's something good. There's something beautiful. There's a certain godness. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying that humans are inherently godly. So there's a certain godness to being a human. God created the human race specifically to be like him, and the incarnation seals this commitment to his human race as his image. What does this mean for me and you? There's more to the sermon than this, but what does this mean for me, for, for me and you? Being a human being is the most important thing that you can be. Being a human being, this is the highest value that you have, the life of a human being, because it's made to look like God. It's made to be a conduit through which God reflects himself to the world. God himself, when he gets to the apex of his own story, when he gets to the climax and the final chapter of what he wants to do to fix his whole world, decides the thing I'm going to become now to make this thing complete is I'm going to become a human being. God himself, until 2,000 years ago, aspired to be a human being. You have deep and infinite value because of this. And it's important for me to say, because our culture is telling you right now that being a human being isn't good enough. That you, go, you all feel it. Who I am, there's got to be something more to this. 
That's a lie. There is nothing more than this. You are the highest form of creation. And it's everywhere, and it's pervasive, and it's even in some places where you don't recognize. A lot of you know that this stuff is true, but let me just make a point of it for a few seconds. Do do any of you know what the beauty premium is? It's a a sociologist study back in the early 1970s, and it's been kind of hammered out, and even there was a study uh, uh, done uh, a couple years ago by a prominent sociologist looking into the beauty premium and what it means. Well, the beauty premium is this. The beauty premium, premium is the reality that sociologists have put their fingers on, that physical attractiveness increases the probability that a person will engender positive attitudes and outcomes, which in turn are likely to lead to tangible social and economic benefits. The beauty premium is this. If you're better looking, you will get more advantages in your life. Now, we as a culture give this to people. We treat people who are better looking better. People who are better looking get better job offers. They get promotions quicker. They get better grades. They get better treatment from people. Sociologists, the most recent study says this, is that a big part of this is trust. There's something about us in our culture that trust people who are better looking. If somebody's ugly, you know, and like every uh, cheapo movie and TV show emphasizes this, the bad guys are ugly and the good people are beautiful. Not always, but... We we tend to trust people who are better looking. And we tend to distrust people who are not as good looking. What does this mean for you? Every single person in here, and I don't care what you say. I don't care if you're like, it doesn't affect me. Every single person in here thinks, I wish I was better looking. The way I look now isn't good enough. I need to somehow transcend the human that I am and become better looking. And if I was, I would be happier. In a certain sense, you're probably right. You probably would make more money if you were better looking than you are. I'm not calling anybody in here ugly. This is what the beauty premium says. And so all of us are driven by this wish that we were in better shape, that our bodies were more toned, that my hair wasn't falling out, that I was better looking. I wish I was different than what I was. That's a lie, though. Because who I am, this is not not a commercial for not trying to get in shape in those things, but who I am is beautiful. It's what God created to me. It's the highest thing that Aaron Miller could be is who I am right now. I'll give you another example. Money is a big part of this too. Not just attractiveness, but money. I was with, uh, I took Harry to, uh, to uh, his cello lesson. He goes to a music school uh, for his cello lesson. His cello teacher, he's back there uh, doing his lesson. And a wood, one of the woodwind teachers there, this is a couple weeks ago, one of the woodwind teachers there comes out with a student, a young girl, and she leads the young girl out to the lobby where I was sitting, where the young girl's sister and her dad uh, were sitting there waiting for her to get out of there. And the teacher comes out and says all the teacher nonsense that music teachers say. It's like, oh, she's just doing so wonderful. It's just so amazing. She's growing so much in her skills and her abilities. And her dad said, I am really glad to hear that. Thank you for telling me. And the, 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 the sister who was sitting there says to the dad, why does that make you so glad? And, uh, you know, so she, she was like four or five. And the, 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 her sister was like eight or nine. And the teacher, the dad doesn't respond. The teacher responds, and this is exactly what she says. I told Harry this when his lesson was over. I said, I almost almost butted in, and then I was like, no, don't be that person. She said, because the better you get at the clarinet, the more scholarship money you can get for college someday. You see what she did? And everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks that. All of you, tell your kids, you need to work hard in school so you can get scholarship money. What we've done is we've reduced the human experience, in this case, the gift of music, to this is a way for you to make money. That's why you're studying clarinet. Not because music is beautiful, not because music taps into something transcendent, but because if you get good at this, you can get more money. College will be cheaper. And so what happens is, is every single one of us, when we're pumping this into eight-year-old clarinet students, you know that every single one of us thinks this. If I had more money, I would somehow be better than I am now. I could get out, if if I had more money, I could maybe break out of this rut that I'm in now. That is a lie. It's a lie. If you're a human being, you are the highest form of life available. It's not just what we do and how we look, though. It's it's getting even deeper and deeper in our culture, this this belief that humanity is not enough. Um, and, And a lot of people are worried right now about uh, AI, or artificial intelligence, and what that means, 
and a lot of jobs are on the line. There's a lot of talk about, um, um, you know, AI taking over very important jobs that have always been kind of the bailiwick of actual real human beings. In fact, uh, Harry and a couple of his weirdo friends were hanging out the other day, and he told me, he said that we, like, got on chat GPT and told it to write sermons. And I didn't ask, are they as good as my sermons? Are they worse than my sermons? Because I didn't want to know. But honestly, you could fire me at some point and just set like an iPad up here and say, chat GPT, do a sermon on Luke 1. And you could all just sit and listen. That's probably not going to happen though, and I'll tell you why. But, but there is this fear, right? I mean, th- there's this fear that like AI is going to take over our world. There was a, an open letter that a bunch of AI scientists, including Elon Musk, wrote this year and published basically saying, slow the AI down. It's going to take over humanity. And there's this one line in the letter that just really struck me. It said, should we develop, it's asking the question, uh, should we develop AI stuff? Should we give AI all this power? It says, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, make us obsolete and replace us? I mean, their answer is no, we shouldn't do that. So we'll say a couple things about this real quick is, one, I, I do think that we need to push back against machines of any type, computer or mechanical, taking jobs away from actual real human beings. That's dehumanizing. It's de- even if it's lower prices for us, again, if we have more money, we're better people. It's dehumanizing, though, to do this. But second of all, I'm not really worried about this because Elon Musk and the people who wrote this letter are working from this standpoint, the standpoint of philosophical materialism. There's a philosophy that kind of came up during the eugenicist movement in the 1920s called transhumanism, which is the word that was invented by Julian Huxley in the 1950s. But basically, it's like this. Now that we know that God doesn't exist, we know that human beings are just like biological machines. And we're in this, we, we've, we've evolved to be who we are now, but humans are going to continue to evolve and get smarter and better. And these people think that this is what's going to happen. Humans are just going to evolve until they give over their intelligence and their agency and their will to computers, and then humans will be turned into like animals, kind of mindless, will be obsolete. There's even a word for this in, in transhumanist circles. It's something called like humanish, that there will be people who say, I don't want to be a computer, turn me into cattle. And they'll continue to be humans, but they'll be ruled over by these machines. Well, you see what the, the, the philosophical viewpoint behind that is, is that there's something better than being a human. And computers are getting there. Like we're giving computers this power, and now humans are going to become obsolete. And what I'm saying here, what, what the truth of the incarnation and the virgin birth is that is this humans will never be obsolete. Because God himself made himself in the form of a human. God invented humans to be image bearers of him. He didn't invent computers or machines to do this. So you don't have to be worried, but there is definitely this fear, along with this desire to be better, to get outside myself. And the response to this is no, be content with who you are. This desire to transcend who you are is the root behind all kinds of things that are broken and sad. The quest to find a better us in our human sexuality. The quest to find a better us in a different gender than the one we are. This all goes back to this notion that we're not good enough, that we need to break out of here. And it's deeply evil, not because it's like something, it's deeply evil because it's deeply broken and sad. It takes God's good gift of who you are and says you're not good enough. Don't believe that lie. You will tell yourself this lie five minutes after the sermon is over in some sort of subtle way. Do not believe it. Jesus became a human being because he wanted to be like you. He didn't turn himself into a computer. He didn't turn himself into a beautiful person. The beauty premium didn't work with Jesus. Isaiah 53 said he was so ugly we couldn't even look at him. He didn't turn himself into a rich person. Even foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus decided, I'm going to be a real, legitimate, down-to-earth, flesh and bones, human being like you guys. Embrace that. Enjoy that. Now, that's, that's the end of the sermon. I haven't really said enough. I've just talked about how great humans are, which is true, but humans are also broken. We are both created beings, which means we're beautiful, and we're fallen beings, which means there's, there's something about us that's broken, which brings us to the second thing. It's not just that there's a godness to humanity. There's also a humanity to God himself. So let's look at verse uh, 32. Verse 30, I'm sorry, verse 31, Gabriel tells Mary, this is going to be your son. 
Verse 32, though, he says he'll be great and will also be called the Son of the Most High. Down in verse 35 kind of reiterates this. The child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus is both a Son of Mary and a Son of God. Jesus is both human and God as well. This is essential. This is essential if we're going to be saved. Because as beautiful as humans are, we are broken. We're turned in ourselves. We can't possibly connect with God. That, that barrier is up there, and we've put it up there. We've rebelled against him, and we've put that up there. So Karl Barth was a, a theologian in uh, Switzerland in the 1920s through 1960s. Um, Karl Barth fought back. So, so uh, a quick boring history lesson. 400 years ago, white people in the West started to play this game. Let's pretend like God doesn't exist. What would the world look like? Descartes was one of these. Descartes believed God existed, but he was like, how can we talk about reality without talking about God? Let's play that game. Well, it wasn't long before people were like, okay, let's just get rid of God altogether, and let's just talk about reality as if he doesn't exist. What, is that? what do you do with Christianity then? What do you do with Christianity in a world where God doesn't exist? Well, Schleiermacher and a lot of other theologians in the 1800s would say, God is that feeling you get down inside yourself when you long for transcendence. It's the feeling of deep love that you have inside yourself when you hold a newborn child. That's what God is. Bart comes along and some other guys in the early 1900s and says, that's bogus. Those things are great. But God is not us. God isn't something happening inside here. God is the great other who stands over and against the humans, both in judgment and in salvation. And he pressed and he pressed on this, that God is other. God does not live inside my head or inside my heart. I can't craft a God who looks like Aaron Miller. God is different than me. Later on in his career in the 1950s, he said, you know what, I need to qualify that. And he wrote an essay called The Humanity of God, where he says, it's true what I'm saying. God is completely other. But since the incarnation, he goes on to say, God is now a human being. And you can't talk about God without talking about him as a human being. And there's this great line from this essay of The Humanity of God that I want to read to you now. In Jesus Christ, Bart says, there's no isolation of man from God or God from man. You can't separate the two. If you think about God, you can only think about Jesus, which means if you think about man, if you think about man, you can only think about Jesus, which means you're thinking about God. If you think about God, you can, because Jesus is the one true man. If you think about God, you can only think about Jesus because Jesus is the only way to know God, which means you're now thinking about the one true man. Man and God go together. You can't think about them separately. And all of our attempts to do so, even those of you who are good religious people, who are like Sunday morning, let's think about God. I'm going to go to work tomorrow. Let's think about human beings and not God. Bart says it's impossible. You can't separate the two of those. Jesus Christ is in his one person as true God, man's loyal partner. And as true man, he is God's loyal partner. He is the Lord, humbled for communion with man. And likewise, the servant exalted to communion with God. He's both, without their being confused, but also without their being divided. He is holy the only and holy the other. Thus, in his oneness, because he's both, Jesus Christ is the mediator, the reconciler between God and man, because he is both God and man. Thus, he comes forward to man on behalf of God. Jesus Christ comes to us on behalf of God, calling for and awakening faith, hope, and love, And he goes to God on behalf of man, representing man, making satisfaction and interceding. Now, this is what Bart's saying. Bart is saying that the human problem is so deep that we need a bridge to get across the impassable gulf between humanity and God. And thankfully, Jesus can plant both feet equally comfortably on the God ledge and on the human ledge so that there is now intercourse. We need this because we're so turned in on ourselves now. We've fallen for the lies of the beauty premium. We've fallen for the lies of economic mobility. We've fallen for the lies of relational and sexual satisfaction to the extent that now we can't see anything but those things without outside help. We've turned responsibility into power. We've turned relationship into manipulation. We've turned loving stewardship into materialism. And now we can't get back except for Jesus comes to bridge this gap. Jesus, because he's a man, is able to offer satisfaction for our sins. He can represent us on the cross. But because he's God, he's powerful enough to come back from that and live forever. Only Jesus can do this. Only the God-man can make this possible. Now, what's behind all this? We're almost done. What's behind all this? Why would God do this? Why would God write a story like this? It just occurred to me within the past six months 
and I don't know why I didn't see it before. I have this conversation with a lot of you, and this, this same theme kept popping up, including with the guy who d- doesn't attend church but told me, I don't have a problem believing in Jesus. The thing I have a problem with is, I'll tell you what it is in just a second, but let me, let me lead up to it. Here's the, when I talk to a lot of LCMS Lutherans, here's where they're at. They've been told, if you've grown up especially in the Lutheran church, you've been told your whole life, you are sinful. You are under the wrath of God and you need to be forgiven. That's true. Well, how does that problem get solved? Then you're told there's some grand scheme to fix the problem, which is there's a transaction you can make. God will make this great cosmic trade with you. He will trade you his righteousness through the cross for your faith. He pays for your sins. You trust in him, and then it's good. You're good to go. And what happens is, and I bet a bunch of you out here are like, yeah, that's what I've been taught. What happens is, is your salvation is basically like a legal transaction. And we talk about justification so much. We talk about justification by itself so much that it almost sounds like a courtroom experience where I'm damned, I'm guilty, somebody paid the price, the judge says, okay, not guilty, stamps it, and I get to walk out. What's missing? Some of you actually told me this explicitly. Some of you, in in, in actual explicit terms, some of you, you've kind of weaved your way around to it, is love. The guy I talked to grew up in a Lutheran church. Doesn't have any problem believing in the Trinity. Doesn't have have any problem believing in substitutionary atonement, the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, the literal resurrection. But what he has problems believing, he says, is that God would love me. That God would love me. He's, been, he's never been told that God loved him. So maybe there's, there's words in it. You know, we see Jesus loves me. But when it comes down to thinking about salvation, it's like, well, there's this, ex- there's this great, great legal exchange that God made. And what I'm saying is, is there's only one reason why God would do this is that he desperately loves you. He desperately loves you. Get the legal nonsense out of your head. I mean, store it back in there. You're gonna need it later. But for just for a few minutes, forget about all that and come to sit in and realize that God desperately loves you. Why else would he want to be like, why else would he choose to be a human? Okay, this third sermon in a row, I'm going to use this illustration. Uh, Chapel at Mel's on uh, Friday, uh, Wednesday night service, and now this morning. I apologize, and I've used it before. And th- th- this, this illustration will wrap us up here. So we had, we had a cat when I was a kid. It was a stray. My mom would feed the cat, and my mom would periodically have to give the cat flea baths because, the, you know, the outdoor cats get fleas. And the cat liked the food. The cat would like rub my mom's leg and purr and it liked the food and say thank you in cat language, whatever that is, purring, I guess. The cat hated the flea baths. The cat despised them. The cat would, uh, my mom would lower the cat into this bucket filled with the warm flea bath water and the cat would shoot its legs out to try and block it from going down into the water. The cat was convinced, you could see in its little cat eyes, it was convinced the crazy lady was trying to kill it. The crazy lady was, it's not true though. But here's the thing is, the cat was thankful for the food, the cat was very unthankful for the flea bath, but my mom was doing both of those because my mom was concerned about the cat. However, my mom was never able to get across to the cat that I'm on your side. Like, this is good for you. It's the kind of thing you say when you're holding a cat over a bucket of warm water. It's like, hey, hey, it's going to be okay. The cat never, ever said, oh, really? Okay, I'll trust you. The cat was always, to, to its dying day, convinced that my mom was a murderous, evil woman who periodically would have breakthroughs of niceness and give him food. What if my mom, now my mom, I guess, I don't know if mom loved the cat or not, but liked the cat, I guess. What if my mom, what would you think if my mom had the ability, because she cared so desperately for that cat, to turn herself into a cat permanently, to be like that cat, to fix, you would say, That is an insane amount of love. Why would you give up being a human being to be a cat? Now, the difference between the cat and my mom is like this ontologically, right? The cat can never understand my mom. My mom can understand the cat, but the cat can never break through my mom. The difference between my mom and me and you and God ontologically is like from here to like 400 feet up there. Why would God in all of his glory, in all of his supreme and sovereign power, 
choose to permanently become a human being in a body to rescue us from our sins. If not for love, it's the only thing that could motivate him to do that. It's the only thing that, that could get him to say, I'm going to create you guys as the ultimate of my creation. And I'm going to make myself like you because I want to be like you, even if it means coming down to earth, becoming a construction worker, being abandoned by my friends, being lynched for a crime I didn't commit. I will do that for you guys. That's all, that's all I want to say to you guys today is like, he loves you so much. It's the only thing that would motivate him to do this is his deep and desperate love for you. You give him immense pleasure. And you say to yourself, those of you who are a little bit like, oh, superstition, you're like, oh, that's kind of creepy. Those of you who are good Lutherans are like, oh, I would never give him pleasure. I'm just a poor sinful worm. Knock it off. You give him deep pleasure. He loves watching you do what you do. Bask in that. Live, it's what the virgin birth means is that the God of creation loves you so much he wanted to be like you and die the death that you're going to die and rise from the dead with you to rescue you. That's Jesus for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. Help us this Christmas to bask in that love, to bask in your humanity, to bask in the godness that you've given to us, not just in being created in your image, but also being transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, through faith. We pray this in his name. Amen. I will ask the choir to come forward now while the ushers take the offering.
Please stand for prayer. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that you would give us the faith that you gave Mary, the faith to believe that you are active, that in your sovereignty that you do whatever you want, but in your love you do whatever you want for our good. Help us to trust you like she trusted you. Lord, in your mercy. Father, I pray that you would be with all who are struggling right now, especially uh, around Christmas where it's where financial concerns are even more pressing and relational concerns are even more pressing and physical pains are a, a reminder of better days without the physical pains and mourning the loss of loved ones is especially painful around Christmas. I, Father, meet us in all of our needs. Make all things new, Father. Bring back what once was lost. Restore what once was stolen. Jesus, come quickly and make your creation new again. For that, Father, even now give us taste of your grace and your mercy, even in the midst of heartache and brokenness. Give us taste of healing in the midst of sickness and loneliness and struggles. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for being committed to us humans and your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for being committed to us when it's us who've caused all the problems, when it's us who've created chaos in the environment, and it's us who've broken our relationships, and it's us who've idolized money and power. And still, Father, you don't let us go. And we pray that you would keep that commitment going, that what you've started, that you would bring to completion, that the author and finisher of our faith, your son, Jesus Christ, would continue to be our champion, would continue to lead and guide, would continue to sanctify us and bring us forward towards the new creation. Lord, in your mercy. For all these things, Father, we pray that you would have your will because we trust you that you are sovereign and loving both. And we know that we can pray and ask you to be our sovereign, loving God and to guide us and direct us and to heal us and to be with us because we know it's your desire because of your deep love for us and because of the fact that you've united us to your son, Jesus Christ, through faith, that you've welcomed us into your throne room, that you call us your daughters and sons. And so we pray this prayer in the name of our brother, Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith now with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and singing. Let's pray in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
we stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in peace.